Uh, yeah, hi everybody. My name is Rick Komskajorski. I'm going to talk about text generation from knowledge graphs. Um, this is work that I've done with my fantastic co-authors, Danush Iwan Morello-Lapata and Hannah Hajashirzi, my advisor. In this talk, I'm going to tell you briefly, as briefly as I can make it, about me. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about how we encode a knowledge graph um, for, that can be used in a variety of applications. The particular application we're going to use that encoding for today is text generation, knowledge to text generation. I'll give you some experimental evidence for the utility of this encoding and this system, and then I'll talk about where we can go with it. So uh, the first thing about me, uh, yeah, so I'm just a regular person who lives on a sailboat and who wrote a musical about how good his dog is once. So personable person. This is supposed to be a video of me sailing by Bainbridge, but it didn't work out, but oh well. Um, but more importantly than personal stuff is research stuff. So I like to think of myself as a good collaborator, and I've done a lot of projects where I, I help out people with my skill set. Um, for example, helping computer people use linguistics. I did a phonological analysis of puns with uh, Aaron Jake and Mario Sendorf. I've helped linguists use computers better, so this is an analysis of a particular syntactic construction in a, a Chomskyan syntactic paradigm. Um, and we analyzed a bunch of Twitter data to make some point about, you know, the mind. Uh, and then I've also helped vision researchers like our friend Sachin uh, here at AI2 continue to dominate NLP conferences with his work on pyramidal uh, recurrent units for language modeling. Uh, my own research uh, centers in computational pragmatics, and so pragmatics is this um, relates to the speaker's intended meaning, which is the meaning that's situated or grounded. This is uh, contrasting with maybe formal semantic meaning, which is maybe a logical form representation. Um, this speaker meaning becomes especially relevant in discourse because the meaning of a particular sentence is um, strongly informed by the surrounding sentences in a document or in a dialogue. Um, and so my work is about parsing and generating with pragmatic representations. And so what are pragmatic representations? They're not a thing that actually exists. We have to go out and coax world representations into our, uh, for our use. So coax them into being pragmatic representations. So for example, um, this paper I did with Ali and Hannah quite a while ago now um, was about grounding um, soccer commentaries in uh, game events. So here we have a commentary uttered by a human being, and it's actually quite a, a difficult set of text to understand um, because it's very colorful. And we want to be able to segment and associate each piece of this commentary with the game events that are happening in real life. Um, in another situation, we treated a um, typed equation tree, which is a structured representation of an equation, as the pragmatic meaning of a narrative math word problem. So these are word problems that tell a story. By understanding the story, you understand what operations and equations are to be used. Um, and so we, we made that association to say, OK, these equation trees can serve as a pragmatic meaning representation. Uh, this was with Oren and Ashish, who I don't see. Um, and then continuing in this vein, uh, I did a line of work where I, um, my goal was to generate math word problems that fit specific thematic characteristics, so topical characteristics, um, while maintaining the, um, the pragmatic meaning as represented by the equation, the underlying equation of the problem. Um, and we found that that pragmatic meaning was strongly correlated with discourse structure. So what we did here is we took problems like, for example, about picking apples or farming or whatever, and smartly substituted all of the farming-themed words with Star Wars-themed words um, to arrive at a new uh, customized problem for the student's interest that maintained the mathematical meaning of the original. Uh, yes, so about me in conclusion, um, I'm pretty good at collaborating. And I'd be happy to talk with any of you about collaborations we might could do. Uh, my work is in computational pragmatics. It's interesting. It's also practical in a lot of cases. And you know, maybe sometimes I'm all right to be around. OK. <coughs> Pardon me. Enough about that. Let's talk about work. 
Uh, so this work is called Text Generation from Knowledge Graphs. It's in submission presently. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. So what we have, um, what I'm going to describe is a graph transformer encoder for encoding knowledge graphs. Um, we're going to incorporate these encodings into an end-to-end -end knowledge graph to text generation system. Um, and also, in order to do this, I introduce a data set called Agenda, which is abstract generation data set um, of knowledge graphs paired with short documents that happen to be scientific abstracts for um, future research. So how do we encode knowledge? Uh, so we can get knowledge from a lot of places. We can find knowledge about world events. Um, we can find knowledge about science, and we can extract knowledge from scientific documents or scientific textbooks. Um, we can frame common sense, as some people have, as uh, a collection of knowledge. And we can even extract knowledge from multimedia. So this image can be thought of as uh, giving us some knowledge about the world. Um, so knowledge is in a lot of places. We really need to figure out good ways to encode it for use in our applications. Um, what applications? So there's a lot of applications where an encoding of knowledge might be useful. So obviously, um, knowledge-based completion is an important application where an encoding could help. But also, if you want to do reasoning across sentences for question answering tasks, if you want to do scene understanding, um, if we want to do dialogue management, uh, there's a lot of places where we have knowledge and we need a good encoding of it in our, in our system so that it can perform optimally. Um, the, uh, like I said earlier, the specific application we're going to focus on today is text generation. So here's an example of the text generation from knowledge problem. So suppose you have an uh, AI system that's serving as a tutor of some kind, right? And it's teaching biology to a student who may or may not be an alien. Um, and during the course of the instruction, the student asks a mildly relevant biological question. Wait, would Bernie Sanders fight a raccoon? I don't know how this could come up, but let's suppose it's contextually licensed. Um, so what we would like is for our our AI system to be able to access its knowledge about the world, right? And it knows that there is a Bernie Sanders, and Bernie Sanders is a human, and humans eat hamburgers, and raccoons eat hamburgers. And so it can synthesize this knowledge into an answer, yes, Bernie Sanders is a human, both humans and raccoons eat hamburgers, and so may fight over a discarded hamburger, right? This obviously is a very toy example, but it's, it gets to the kind of things that we can do with knowledge and the kinds of reasons we would need a text, a knowledge graph to text generation system. Uh, so how we're going to do this? Well, um, recently, as probably well known to most people, um, the, an encoder-decoder setup for text generation, where some input is turned into a bunch of vectors, and then those vectors are used to condition the generation of tokens in the output. Um, this is a very standard and powerful way to generate text. Um, so if we had some way of encoding our knowledge graph, um, we could then decode text according to standard techniques. So how can we encode knowledge? Um, well, so there's been a lot of work on this. Uh, so earlier work, Transy and others, um, treated the knowledge as a collection of triples or maybe even pairs of pieces of information, um, which were going to be combined into uh, which are going to be combined by some, by some function. The function might be the, the relation that obtains between them. Um, these pairwise encodings are good. They offer minimal information propagation. Um, so more recently, people have tried to look at how can we encode knowledge as a graph. Um, so graph-structured knowledge gives us the chance to propagate information across multiple relations, so from longer distances. And that seems to be helpful in some tasks. Um, so one option was a graph LSTM, which gates the information propagation. Um, a shortcoming of this is that the information of adjacent nodes in the graph is only combined via a sum operation, which is maybe suboptimal. Um, rectifying this, we have graph convolutions, which are very fast. And so when you're working with larger knowledge graphs, this is a good option. Um, a problem with convolutions is they're relatively rigid. So you can only look at a fixed number of neighbor nodes. Um, and, may, and, and at least for parameter sharing purposes, you can only look at a fixed number of neighbor nodes. Um, and so to sort of generalize from this, um, very recently there was a paper called Graph Attention Networks, which is a weighted combination of neighbors. 
Um, it uses an attention mechanism that's specifically um, focused on the graph structure. Um, and it, so it's a little bit more flexible. It's, it also, like convolutions, is a, a, a spectral method, which is to say it operates over the graph as a list of vertices and, and some matrices describing their interaction, um, which means it's fast and flexible. Um, but a problem that we have with the graph attention network is that a, there's a very basic interaction between uh, a particular vertex and the adjacent nodes, um, that being the attention mechanism or a weighted sum. So uh, we introduce then the graph transformer. Um, and this is building off the very popular text transformer architecture um, from attention is all you need. Uh, Vaswani's NIPS paper in 2017. Um, this, uh, the text transformer is really good at contextualizing a word in the context of a, a sequence of words. Um, we update that to being able to contextualize a vertex in a neighborhood of vertices. And um, moreover, by stacking, by using the, the stacked um, architecture of the transformer, we're able to propagate information um, across the entire graph so that Every vertex can have some relationship to every other, but that relationship is mitigated by a number of um, parameters that we incorporate into our architecture um, that help um, help us decide how help us learn how to contextualize a node representation based on its neighbors. So I'll go through this in a little bit more detail now. Um, so the first thing is that to know is that our graph transformer takes as inputs a featural representation of vertices, which is to say each vertex is represented as a vector, and an adjacency matrix describing the connections in the graph. Um, and so a key point here to note is that this and some of these other spectral methods operate over unlabeled graphs. Um, but we're going to describe some techniques for taking a labeled graph and converting it to an unlabeled graph without loss of information later. Um, and then so that's the input to the transformer. The output is a uh, collection of, ver of vectors that represent graph contextualized vertex encodings. Um, and so this is an unordered collection of vectors that can be used in downstream tasks when, where, um, such as text generation, where you attend over these vectors in order to, com um, in order to use them in your decision process. That's correct. The same number of vertices out as go in. Um, OK, so, so looking at this architecture, first I'm going to talk about the graph attention specifically. And then I'm going to describe how the rest of these um, layers affect the, the transformation. So um, the first thing to know is that uh, so a graph attention um, or graph self-attention is Every vertex in the graph is updated with a learned weighted combination of its neighbors. So here, for example, we have this vertex H1, and it's connected to its neighbors, 2 through 6. Um, we're going to take a weighted combination of these neighbors and combine that with the original vertex H1 to arrive at a new um, updated vertex H1 prime. Um, and so specifically, that's shown in equations here, where uh, this um, double bar here indicates, um, indicates that what we're doing is we're concatenating um, multiple attention heads. So this is called multi-headed attention. And uh, how it works basically is that we compute a prob what's like a probability distribution over all of the neighbors. And that distribution indicates how important each neighbor is um, to the, the combination. And we do that multiple times so that we can have multiple different ways of looking at our neighbors. Um, and so that probability distribution is described by this equation here. And then this summation is how we combine, uh, do a weighted combination for one uh, attention head. And then we concatenate n of them together to get the representation uh, for the next time, next time step, you can think of it as. OK, so um, the graph attention is good, uh, but we can add a little bit more modeling power by using this block architecture um, that we're borrowing from the, trans the attention is all you need paper. Um, so each block computes these 
four operations. Uh, it, <coughs> it computes graph self-attention for all vertices in the graph. And then all of these are uh, subjected to normalization. We have a residual connection with the original input to fac facilitate information flow. We then pass that through a feed-forward network with two layers and some nonlinear <coughs> activation in between. Um, to, that's, so this is a more expressive way of contextualizing the vertices. We then um, repeat the normalization and have a residual connection to this intermediate state that we were at before the feed-forward network. So this is a, a sort of a slower transformation of the information. Um, and then we can repeat this whole structure L number of times, so stacked up into a number of layers, where the output for each uh, layer is the input to the next layer. Um, and then when you've done this L times, you have effectively allowed for information from sort of distant nodes to kind of slowly creep in to the current node that you're working with. So that's how we affect information propagation through the graph. Um, so here are some advantages of this technique. Um, so like I mentioned before, we use attention, which operates over local neighborhoods, which means that we, we can handle, unlike, for example, um, many convolutional methods, we can handle unseen graph structures at inference time. Um, and additionally, attention assigns a very detailed importance, especially multi-headed attention, lets us very um, articulate the importance of all of our neighbors in a very detailed way. And one of the benefits of this for our task is that we can learn to assign lower weights to noise um, if we have noisy graph that's perhaps automatically constructed, which we will, a little foreshadowing there. Um, and then we get this additional modeling power from the block parameters and so these transformations let us look at uh, the neighborhood of a node and decide based on that whole neighborhood how to update um, the vertex representation as we go through the layers of the network, as we propagate information across the graph. So that's our encoder that I'm introducing. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, that's correct. Well, we don't have position type encoding. Um, we get position information by um, what's available to each layer. So the first layer uh, of this structure is this node is only going to have access to anything it's connected to in the graph. But during the second layer, these, all of these neighbors are going to be updated with their, uh, with their neighbors, and so in the second layer, this will have access to two degrees of the graph and on and on through the, the different layers. Yes? Do you also include different types of positions? Uh, so the transformer works over unlabeled graphs only. Um, I will show you in a bit how we take a labeled graph and convert it to an unlabeled graph so that relations are vertices in this graph. The loss function is dependent on the task. Um, so this is going to go into an end-to-end -end system, which I'm about to describe. And the loss of whatever task we're attempting here um, will backpropagate all the way into the parameters of the graph attention network. I'm sorry, the graph transformer. Great. Um, yeah, so now I'll describe how we incorporate this encoder into a knowledge to text system. Um, so text generation is an uh, interesting and difficult task, and it can be more or less difficult depending on what you're trying to um, generate. So in, the, um, in a very straightforward case, we have machine translation or generating from semantics. Um, and what we, what we, what's nice about this problem is that you have a very, uh, almost a bijection of information between the source and the target. So a lot of um, information overlap in this problem. Uh, and also you have order, uh, ordering of both components. Your input and your output is ordered, and that's why you can build seek-to-seek -seek models for these kind of tasks. Um, a little more flexible here, we've got image captioning or summarization, where you have a very um, information-dense source, like an image. Right? Picture is worth a thousand words, but its caption is only ten words. Right? So you're going from an information-dense source to an information-sparse output. Um, 
And order is a little trickier depending on exactly the, the parameters of the task. If you're doing multi-image or multi-document summarization, um, ordering is a question you have to deal with. In knowledge to text, we have a lot less correlation between the input and the output. Um, and you could argue that the output is semantically richer uh, than the input in some ways. And so that's possibly why we need a lot more parameters for this task. Um, we have unordered but structured input, right? So a, a knowledge graph has no obvious ordering, but it does have a lot of structure that we can use. Um, and then what distinguishes this from other text generation tasks is that in order to express the many um, like relations and, and pieces of information in the knowledge graph, we, we definitely need to use multiple sentences in our output. So we have very long outputs here. And then lastly, depending on where these knowledge graphs come from, um, you may or may not have, they may or may not be noisy. So if they're automatically constructed knowledge graphs, there's a likelihood that there's going to be a fair amount of noise in them. Um, and, and in fact, so wh what, what knowledge graphs are we going to use for this task? So uh, let me introduce the agenda data set. So this is a data set that takes titles and abstracts from 40,000 uh, scientific papers from AI conferences. This is part of the Semantic Scholar Corpus. Um, this data set is uh, annotated with automatic uh, science information extraction system called SciIE. It's a, a very good system, state of the art in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, in the ways that you could judge state of the artness. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so this is my co-author, Elon, made this system and has been improving it for a while. It's a pretty good system. Um, and so it extracts information like this, like it, it can extract co-reference information. Here, the, the things that are color-coordinated are co-referenced. Um, it extracts these relationships between scientific entities. It handles the fact that scientific text has a very complicated open domain vocabulary. So it's a good system. Um, we, we run this, uh, but it is an automatic system, and so it's subject to a bit of noise. We run this system over our 40,000 abstracts and create a knowledge graph for each abstract by collapsing the coref uh, that the system indicates, and then labeling these edges as relationships and labeling the vertices as scientific terms. Uh, some details about this data set. Uh, it's, you know, it's relatively big. It's a decent sized data set. You can learn from it. Uh, some key details here, though, is the fact that the average number of vertices in the graph is 12 and a half. Um, and this indicates to the named entity, the scientific terms that have been extracted from the abstract. The average number of edges, which corresponds to the relationships, is closer to four and a half. So what we have here are um, unconnected, s relatively sparse graphs. The generation task that we're going to accomplish then is to take the, the document's title and our knowledge graph about uh, extracted, automatically extracted from the text, and try to recreate the uh, try to recreate the abstract text. Um, and so this is a, a surrogate for the kind of problems that I described earlier in text generation, where you don't have some kind of gold truth. Here we have this gold truth. It's a very controlled environment. It makes it easy to precisely evaluate how well our model is working. Ah, the model, yes. So there is a model. It's this model. It's, uh, as I said, an encoder-decoder framework uh, that uses multi-headed attention on the title and graph at each decoder time step. And uh, in, in line with many uh, encoder-decoders, we decode one word at a time. And we have the option to either decode from our vocabulary or copy a named entity from the graph. So I'll describe this in a little bit more detail right now. Um, the first thing is we have to get our graphs into here, right? So we need to pre-process our graphs. Now, like I said, the graph transformer takes unlabeled graphs, but our knowledge graphs are often disconnected and labeled. So how we're going to deal with that is we're going to do two modifications to the graph. First is, in order to connect the graph, and, and this is not a necessary step, but it's good for our task, we're going to add a global vertex G which connects to all of the vertices and allows for information flow from all ver between all vertices in the graph. And then the next thing we're going to do is a um, graph modification where we take the relations on the edges. And so like I said, we have these labeled edges. Um, and we convert those labels to vertices. Now, we have this other problem that we have directed 
labeled edges. So just converting the label to a vertice and hooking it up doesn't completely capture the directional information. So in fact, we're going to replace each edge with two vertices, one representing the forward direction of the relationship and one representing the backward direction. We then hook them up to the original vertices of the graph in this um, triangle par parallelogram structure. Um, and that maintains both the label information and the directionality inform information of the knowledge graph. And so what, what we have here at the end is a um, un unlabeled directed connected graph. And that's something that our encoder can handle. Uh, yes? If you have the same label, R1, between V1 and V3, you have, <coughs> you'd use the same uh, new vertex VR1, or would you have a different one for you? Yeah, so the question is, if we have the same label, um, if R1 and R2, for example, are the same label type, let's call it, um, we would use different vertices, but those vertices would be would be represented by the exact same embedding at the bottom layer of the graph. Yes. Um, could, could you motivate a little bit more why you would choose to represent the graph structure like this? Like, uh, it's not a, a fundamental like problem with the graph attention model that requires you to have unlabeled or and undirected edges. Like, for instance, you could imagine uh, having different heads for different directionalities of edges, like why this way? Yeah, so, so to be clear, I'm not getting rid of the directions. Yeah. Um, so we're going to end up with a directed graph still. Uh, but it's true that, so what, the, what, the, um, what was proposed is um, in the graph attention to have different heads specific to different relations um, is a possible way of doing this. That's a possible way of doing this. Um, and I think it would be really great to try. Um, but, but part of the reason you might want to do it this way is suppose you have a 10,000 relation types. So now you're asking for your model to have 10,000 separate heads for each relation, each dealing with a very, very sparse graph. So this way, we can really cut down on model parameters, putting all of those different relation types into embeddings rather than the structure of the model itself. OK. So now we have a graph that we can encode, um, almost. We have a graph that's adjacency matrix is right, but we still need a featural representation of the vertices. Um, so for this, we use a bidirectional LSTM span encoding over the, the entity text. Um, and now we have these featural representations that are uh, equally sized for every vertex. Um, we can now use our graph transformer to encode this knowledge graph. Uh, and we can use a uh, by LSTM to encode the title to get a collection of vertices representing the information in the title. Uh, sorry, a collection of vectors representing the information in the title. Um, and then the next step is we want to attend over this. So in our decoder, at each time step, before we make a decision about what word to output, we're going to compute a multi-headed attention independently over the graph contextualized vertex encoding. So these are the result of running our graph through the graph transformer, as well as the title encodings to get independent uh, context vectors for each, which we then combine um, like so uh, in order to uh, create a context vector t. So um, it's from the hidden state of our RNN decoder and this context vector t that we decide two things. We decide, do we want to copy from the input and uh, we compute this uh, switch here, P, which tells us how likely it is that we're going to copy from the input versus generating from the uh, surface, uh, from the vocabulary. And then our full output probability is we t uh, multiply P by some distribution over the input vertices, and we calculate that distribution using attention over the graph contextualized uh, in encodings. Uh, and then with probability 1 minus p, we're going to generate from our, our 20,000 word vocabulary. And so we just do this 200 times, and we have a scientific abstract, kind of. Uh, so to train this, we're going to train this model end to end. Um, so like I was mentioning earlier, we can backpropagate the loss, um, which is a cross entropy loss, through the decoder and all the way into the encoder parameters. Um, 
a couple of details here. We use teacher forcing, which means during training, we're, pat we're going to give the gold human authored abstract previous word as the input token to the RNN decoder. Um, at inference, then, we can just use the model's own generations to, um, to decide how to write the, the final text. OK. So here's uh, some experiments. So how do we evaluate this? We're going to use some standard text generation metrics. So we have blue and meteor. And these are pretty good automatic metrics for this task because there's a lot of overlap between the, in, um, sorry, because there's um, a very good, very strong gold signal here. Um, but to amplify this, we're also going to use a human evaluation to help us answer some specific questions that we have about our generation and about our model. Um, so we uh, got 15 experts. Um, so, th so one of the problems here with this scientific uh, document generation is that uh, it's very, it's not crowdsourceable. We tried crowdsourcing it and it didn't work, unfortunately, but we tried. Um, but then we got it to work by actually uh, enlisting computer science grad students to be the judges. And we use a best worst scaling system, right? So we're giving them three generated abstracts and we're saying, tell me which one is the best, tell me which one is the worst. This is a theoretically grounded um, evaluation technique. And we're going to ask for three. Um, judgment. So we want them to judge on three characteristics. The grammar and fluency of the generated text. So is it syntactic? Does it make sense? Um, the coherence in terms of does it follow the document structure of a scientific abstract, which is to say does it begin with an introduction? Does it give you a problem? Does it tell how we're going to solve this problem? Does it end with some evaluation metrics maybe or something? Um, so that's coherence. And then for those models that make use of knowledge, we're going to ask uh, for an, a judgment of informativeness, which is to say how much of the knowledge that was supposed to be in the text ended up in the text. Yes. So this might be a dumb question. When you're training the system, are you comparing the generated abstracts with the real abstracts? Yes. I'm looking at some scenarios here. And how are you comparing the two uh, so, during training to compute the loss? Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. So maybe I went over that a little bit too quickly. Um, so we're using uh, cross entropy loss at a token level. So what we're doing is at every time step, we're comparing the generated token distribution that our model gives to the, the gold token distribution or the one hot distribution. Well, so it's. Um, so because. Um, um, because the model is given, so the, the idea of teacher forcing is that we're giving the model, it, um, okay, let me say two things. First, um, the decoder uses an RNN, which maintains a hidden state um, through the entire previous generation. And so that gives some context as to everything that has happened before. And um, secondly, we're using teacher forcing, which is a technique where we give the, um, the RNN takes as its inputs, a hidden state, a recurrent hidden state, and the previous word from the sequence, and um, and so uh, this these this combination allows us to to consider the next word generation task to be sort of more a little bit more of a global uh, prediction problem, let's say. Um, but to answer the question directly, did we use something like, like blue or meteor or some n-gram mm -hmm. uh, objective in our training? The answer is no. OK, sorry about that. Um, yes? So the data set of 40,000 abstracts, were they all computer science, I assume, abstracts? Yeah, in fact, they're all from AI conferences. So they're computer science and math. There's some notion of coherence because different disciplines might have a different structure of the abstract? Yes, that's true. Um, so the, the coherence is a relatively um, flexible judgment. And in fact, you'll see some abstracts where, um, so, so even within AI, there's quite a lot of variance as to how a person needs to organize the information that they're trying to get across. Right. So in the math heavier or sort of optimization 
abstract, so you get a different overall structure. In fact, if you're introducing an evaluation metric, you'll have a very different abstract structure, and thus different qualities would need to be met to be coherent than if you're giving a description of a new model that you've produced. Um, so there's some variance, but not as much as science generally. Like, do you think that the model might have picked up that based on the structure of the, maybe, maybe on the title or on the structure of the graph, it should um, optimize for a certain type of abstract? Do you have any? Yes, I think we do see variants like that. So the model can pick up on basically what sub -dis roughly what subdiscipline the paper falls into and sort of what stylistic um, techniques are required. And in fact, you'll see that there's a lot of vocabulary that is, appears in the generated abstract that's not in the graph. And that's, it's good if that's subdiscipline specific vocabulary. Um, okay, so this is our evaluation setup. We have um, our automatic evaluations and our human evaluations. Um, and then we're going to compare these four models. So graph writer is how we describe our end-to-end -end text generation system with the graph transforming encoder. We compare this to a graph attention network. So we replace just the encoder component of the system with a graph attention network. Um, we compare this to, so to understand the um, value of adding knowledge in particular, the relational knowledge of the graph. We have a model called Entity Writer, which takes an unstructured list of entities and does not contextualize them with the graph encoding. And then we finally compare this against a recent work um, from Wang and Joe et al. at NACL 2018, um, where they have a gated rewriter that runs on the same domain. So it was built over generating scientific abstracts, but it only uses the title of the document to facilitate uh, to condition generation. So it uses this rewriting mechanism to generate good scientific abstracts using just the title. Uh, so here are some results. So these are blue and meteor scores. Um, so you can see the rewriter method, which uses no knowledge, just a title, is, does very poor on this data. Um, when we give it a list of entities to generate from, the entity writer model can do significantly better. Um, and then we see that if we use the knowledge, which is um, the relational information that we're given in the graph, uh, to contextualize the entities and the vertices, uh, we can achieve even better results. The GATT uh, model gets a blue score of 12.2, but our graph writer improves on that to 14.3. So two blue points is, is pretty good in generation. Um, and we ran several instances of both the, the graph attention and graph writer model and found that um, there's, no, there's no overlap, at least in these few instances. So I think that it's a pretty strong result that the graph writer outperforms the graph attention in this task. Um, and then we ask for some more, uh, some questions that only humans will be able to answer. So one question is, does knowledge improve generation? Um, so we have blue scores to sort of hint at this, but then we go to the humans and we show them the results of the rewriter model, which has no knowledge, it's just conditioned on title. Um, we show them our system, which uses the graph knowledge completely, and then we show the human authored abstracts. And so we get this, just, we show them 50 randomly selected paper titles from the test set. We get this um, best worst scaling, where humans naturally are always the best, or are frequently always the best, they're never the worst. Um, and then surprisingly, sometimes even the automatic systems are deemed as better, and that's because, um, in part, it's very difficult uh, to judge an abstract that's outside of your domain of expertise. So even our expert annotators were sometimes caught off guard. Um, but these are the trends that we would expect and hope to see where kind of our knowledge-based system sits right in the middle between the humans and the, the knowledge agnostic system. Another question we have is, does relational knowledge improve text generation? So, for this, we're going to compare the graph writer, which has the relational knowledge, to the entity writer, which doesn't. And we're going to get specific judgments on the three characteristics that we talked about, our structure, informativeness, and grammar. Um, and we asked for per criterion ranking in this one. And so here we see that generally, um, the, so the column, the win column indicates where the graph writer outperforms the entity writer. Generally, for structure and grammar, 
uh, and informativeness. It's true that the graph writer outperforms entity writer, so we do utilize that relational information, and it does make a difference in human judgments of text quality um, and uh, along these metrics. Could you, could you give a brief description of those three things? Yeah, sorry, I, I can get, go over it again. So structure, again, is a um, syntactic structure, um, and it's, it's actually structure and fluency. So it's syntactic structure. Um, does the text repeat itself very many times? Um, informativeness is about how well the um, output text reflects the input knowledge that was given to the model. And uh, ooh, I'm sorry, there is an error here. I, I think structure actually should be coherence. Um, yeah, sorry about that. That's a bug. And it's in the submission, so great. Um, so structure is coherence, actually, and grammar is, is what I was describing earlier, where you have this syntactic um, and the fluency relationships. And now structure captures how well does the output text match the structure of a scientific abstract. So does it start with an introduction? Does it move on to describing a, a model or a proposal and then end with a, some evaluation or something? Yes? I did not try that, but that's a, that's a good question. I should try that. Thank you. OK, let's move quickly away from this erroneous slide. OK, so here's some output. So um, the title is Blocking Group Regularized Sparse Modeling for Dictionary Learning. The knowledge graph um, is a lot longer than this, but some of the important relations that obtain here are that sparse representations are used for optimization problems. Dictionary blocks are used for dictionary learning. Optimization problems are used for sparse coding. This is actually a little bit noisy because it should be, I, I believe, the other way around, that sparse coding is used for optimization. And so we'll look at the three models. So the entity, um, so what I've done here is I've bolded um, the use of terms from the knowledge, um, and I've underlined things that are wrong, basically. So in this first entity writer, we have a lot of use of the knowledge. Um, but it says some things that really don't make any sense. So for example, the learning framework is based on the descent, which is a block structure of the group structure. I don't think that's exactly right. Um, the graph attention network model does a little better. Um, but it has this problem of, of over-repeating things. So it says, we consider the problem of dictionary learning in well-known data sets. In particular, we consider the problem of dictionary learning where the goal is to find a set of dictionary blocks that maximize the likelihood of a given set of dictionary blocks. Right? So um, not exactly using the knowledge graph information as precisely as we need to. Um, the graph writer, on the other hand, um, in this you know, very cherry-picked example, obviously, uh, does not make any mistakes in the first two sentences. It will start making mistakes in the next two or three. Um, but it also makes use of, of the knowledge very well. And because the knowledge is strongly contextualized by the, the graph transforming architecture, it uses those terms in very sensible ways throughout the text. Yes? In the decoder of the baseline, can you use coverage in order to implement the representation? Coverage in that kind of interaction? Yeah. So um, in the decoder, we have it's an input feeding decoder, which um, for those who don't know, is the attention that is the context vector that's computed by the attention at every time step is fed into the decoder at the next time step, which gives, which gives the model a chance to look at what it has previously attended to. And attention is strongly correlated with coverage. Um, so that's how we care for that. OK, so um, coverage, great thing to bring up, because in fact, we do fail at coverage quite a lot. In fact, upwards of 40, nope, not upwards, at 40% of uh, the named entities from the input uh, don't appear in the output. So this is a problem that we still have to deal with. And then also, um, there's a lot of repetition. This is typical of a, of a lot of encoder-decoder models, and especially when you're generating longer spans of text, you end up getting a lot of repetition. We see that here as well. 18% of sentences have some kind of repetition uh, at the clause or sentence level. Um, and then. Obviously, there's syntactic variance in the repetition. So it's, yeah, repetition is a problem for our model as well as a lot of other uh, text generation models. OK. Uh, I should have put a conclusion slide there, but thus concludes that part. 
um, about the model. Now, for a few minutes, I'll talk about what can we do with this kind of a model, what needs to be done to bring it, you know, to, to maximize its utility, and then um, maybe a little bit longer down the road ideas. So immediately, we can improve the, the modeling um, in the graph transformer. So right now, regardless of graph size, we run it through six layers, um, and that's not optimal for information propagation. We should run it through the number of vertices minus one layers. Um, so I think with a different organization of the data, I'd be able to affect that change so that every graph is fully propagated and not over-propagated. Um, additionally, we could add some smarter transformations in the block network. So there's been some work that Sachin did um, and that shows that high dimensional representations in these kind of models are really helpful if you can manage to um, use smart high dimensional transformations. And so we have one called the pyramidal transformation that might be useful in this model uh, to allow for the, yeah, these higher dimensional representations in the block network. Um, and then finally, it'd be good to have a better, better featural representation of the vertices. So I said at the bottom layer of the model, we have vertices that are just, um, we run a by LSTM over them. Um, we've tried using some more sophisticated modeling techniques uh, like ELMO and have so far not found the correct settings uh, for that. But I have some ideas on how we can do it a little bit better in the future. Um, additionally, yeah, so this is a pretty simple end-to-end -end model that's trained with a cross-entropy loss. It would be good to have some, some more objectives in here um, to maybe help uh, add robustness to the encoding, the graph encoding. So one I was thinking of is pre-training with a knowledge-based completion objective. So we would mask out one vertex of the knowledge graph and then try to predict that from all of the others. And this would bolster the representations of every vertex. Um, there are some techniques for um, reducing repetition and increasing coverage from the literature. There, um, I don't think anybody has figured it out yet, especially for long form generation, but um, we might can try. Uh, adding those, and then uh, recently it's been a lot of interest in sort of decoupling the content planning and surface realization uh, steps of long form text generation. So um, this is possible with our model. Right now our model, we encode the graph and then leave it unordered and then just generate multiple sentences from it. But you could imagine encoding the graph and then infecting an ordering of the encoded vertices and then generating uh, in a much more incremental fashion. And then lastly, we're very interested in how well this encoder generalizes to other tasks. So right now, me and Danush are working on using this encoder in AMR to text generation. Um, and then there's been a little bit of movement from E. Luan, another co-author on this paper, and using this for a vertex, uh, uh, for, for, sorry, for using this for knowledge-based completion. Um, and then generally, these encoders are, are tested on vertex or graph classification for larger graphs, like protein structure graphs or things like this. So we're going to try and incorporate this encoder into that task setup as well. Um, so I'll leave you on this thought. So I'm really interested, like I mentioned at the beginning, in pragmatic meaning. And I, I also mentioned that I have to go and find pragmatic meaning representations wherever they happen to be. Um, and so now I'm thinking that maybe these, this knowledge is a pretty good pragmatic meaning representation. It seems to have worked. We were able to encode it and generate from it. So that's one half of the meaning representation set up. Um, the other would be, can we generate the knowledge from the text, right? So the information extraction component. And I've been thinking about this really cool paper from Walid. Uh, and Noah from 2015 NIPS called Conditional Random Field Autoencoders for Unsupervised Structure Prediction, where they're autoencoding through um, part of speech tags, basically, but you have some structured intermediate representation in the autoencoder. So this, uh, this allows you to have an autoencoder objective to uh, accomplish the, the parsing task, or in this case, the information extraction task, right? So it's this arrow of the model. Um, where if we had a system that could do this end to end, we could back propagate uh, the reconstruction loss versus some kind of constraints on the graph structure. So 
in the supervised setup, you have supervision from uh, whatever ontology of information you're looking at. In the unsupervised setup, perhaps something like graph diameter, so um, to make sure that you're not just adding too many nodes willy-nilly. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of the long-range long range vision I have for this work. This is what I'd like to accomplish with it. And in this talk, uh, I've described this half. Uh, it's definitely the smaller half of the system, but I've, I've described this half of the system. So uh, in conclusion, yeah, I've introduced to you the graph transformer encoder, encoder um, and a data set for, abs uh, for knowledge graph to text generation, as well as an end-to-end -end system that works with that data set. Thank you.